We live in a time where masculinity is shamed and men don't know what it means to be a man. As a pastor and counselor, I've spent the better part of my life equipping and training others. My goal with this show is to translate my hard-earned experience into tools and tactics to help you become stronger as a man. This is the Brave Co. Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Bellet. Hey, Brave Co. Men, I want to tell you about a project that we just finished. It's our Foundations of Masculinity 12 video series that will really help you grow stronger, more confident as a man. Whole bunch of guys are wondering, man, how do I deal with my pain? How do I learn healthy boundaries? How do I lead myself, my family well? How do I become a leader? This course is for you. If you're interested in growing, take 12 weeks out of your life, dig in, do it with a friend, and really up your game. Guys, you can purchase this at bravecode.org. Now on to this week's episode. Well, Chris Cruz, thanks so much for joining me today. Yeah. Um, man, <clears throat> we've been friends for quite a long time, worked together yeah. for a long time. Um, when we both had hair. came on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, it's gone. <laughs> yeah, bro. It's so true. You were, uh, man, you came on staff at Bethel at what, 22? 22. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. 35 Which, uh, now I, came on staff when I was 22. Dude, that's awesome. I mean, that's a long time. Yeah, yeah, kind of. <laughs> you get your lumps. You get beat up. 22. You get thrown into the sharks right away. It's good. Yeah. Well, it's been so fun because we worked together at the school of yeah. ministry for quite a while. And then mm -hmm. both of us eventually transitioned out of the school of ministry. Yeah. And um, now I do different stuff uh, like the men's yeah. local men's ministry, but yeah. you are a mm -hmm. senior over uh, associate pastor. Associate. Yeah. Which mm -hmm. is so cool. Yeah. And you also I don't oversee, know how here. <laughs> you also oversee um, our young adults ministry, our tribe ministry. Yeah. So man, mm -hmm. when it comes to, when it comes to um, discipleship, um, theology, yeah. even sexuality, like, you're mm -hmm. one of my favorite guys to talk to That's awesome. about this subject. And so I'm just so mm -hmm. stoked to have you on here um, because That's you're all, kind, you're like such a wealth of information and you you look at it a, a differently than I do, which mm -hmm. is awesome. Yeah. So today I want to um, I want to dive in a little bit and just hear your story. Like, I mean, we don't have to hear like every detail, but I'd love to hear about okay. like where do you, where'd you come from? Cause you weren't born mm -hmm. in Reading. No, no, definitely not. <laughs> and what was, what was, um, life like a little bit. And then, mm -hmm. um, we're going to dive into what does it mean to be a disciple in the life of a disciple? So, um, but tell me your right. story, take me through your story. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was born in New Jersey, born and raised there, um, in the East coast. And so, uh, I'd gone to church most of my life, but was not actively involved in any way would go every Sunday because my mom and dad made me go like most kids whose parents were involved in church. Um, and so I'd go every Sunday, but zero connection to it. Uh, and I was in a porn addiction. And then I had in about, I think it was 2005, I had a radical encounter with the Holy Spirit in the living room home group that my parents were hosting. And I had this radical moment with the Holy Spirit um, that uh, I wasn't, even involved in the home group, they asked me to come down and prophesy over me. And when they came and prophesied over me, I, I was hit with the power of the Holy Spirit. And out of my mouth came a language. I had no idea what it was. And I was overturned in tears, just heat through my whole body. Um, this love that was so completing, I felt like uh, my insecurities kind of melted away in that moment. I felt myself completely whole. And then from that moment on, I had a radical love for Jesus uh, overnight. And that led to a freedom from the porn addiction that led to a whole different way of doing life. And my, my journey there was completely different overnight from that day. My passion, my hunger, things I wanted to pursue in life, the things that were in front of me just wasn't like a, a gradual change for my heart. It was a overnight change for my heart, but it was, this, it was but that overnight change um, and whole holistic growth 
was sustained through other things, but the passion, the hunger, the trajectory, the direction of my life, what, what I wanted in life, that all changed when I encountered the Holy Spirit. And man, that's that incredible. Dramatic. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah. Did you have mm -hmm. any grid for the prophetic? I, very little. Like I would hear it on TV at some of the, like my parents, you know, would have like TBN or other things like that. And they would talk about prophetic. And then you hear about like in comic books, like prophecies and st Star Wars, the prophecy. So the, there's, there's little things like that, but it wasn't like a prophetic culture that I was hearing stuff prophesied. And or, it was the first time I had ever received prophetic ministry. That's for sure. And then all in one, like, fell swoop you mm -hmm. you like had this encounter with god mm -hmm. got like started speaking in tongues i'm assuming yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah and did before. you have did you have a grid for speaking in tongues yeah i'd heard other people do it but in that moment i had no idea what was going like going down like it's just <laughs> it was flowing in a way that i'm like what is happening um and it was weird. Like I probably could have resisted it if I wanted to, as it was flowing. I probably now when I when I think about it, I'm like I probably could have tried to shut it down, um, but it would have been very difficult to do because it felt almost uncontrollable. It, it did feel very involuntary. Not I knew that it wouldn't be uncontrollable. I knew that God would respect whatever in that moment if I decided to resist it, but it felt uncontrollable and it was definitely coming out in a language I didn't know. Um, and speaking in tongues. So I'd heard people speak in tongues, but I was like, I'm not faking this thing. I'm not just saying stuff. I'm not going to do that. And actually that's what happened after the first time I said, I'm not going to fake this. I didn't know that you could exercise speaking in tongues. I thought it had to be because mine was so dramatic. I thought it had to be dramatic like in order for, yeah. Thing. Yeah. Like, so I told the Lord, I'm not going to do that again. Um, unless you move on me like that. Like, I'm not going to just speak in tongues. Um, and then another night it happened to me again and involuntarily it started flowing. And then later on in life, I started to learn what it is to exercise the gift, exercise the spiritual gifts and speak in tongues and operate in other gifts. But it was definitely a dramatic experience. Yeah. So from there, like, how did you get to Reading? Um, I went to a conference my mom had uh, tickets to, and I went to one of the sessions and I saw somebody's intern and they were doing ministry to people. They were praying for them and ministering in a way that I was like, I, you're different. I had this unction that I was supposed to quit community college and go do uh, ministry school of some sort, go be a pastor. And so I felt this call to be a pastor and felt this inner, just like, this is what I want to do now. I feel like I'm supposed to help people experience this. And so I met this person's intern at this conference and I was like, you do this so different than everybody else here. Where do you, where, where are you from? And where did you learn this? And she was like, oh, I went to school at Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry in Redding, California. I was like, that's where I want to go. So I had applied to other ministry schools um, just because they were like, they had a booth there or something like that. But when I did that, you actually interviewed me. I don't know if you remember this. You actually interviewed me back then. You were still working in first year as an interviewer still. And I got interviewed by you while I was in the summer. And then I, um, so I applied for the school and my mom knew all about Bethel and I had no idea about Bethel. And so I had applied to go to the school and that's how I found out. And then when I got accepted, I, I moved out here. That's wild. I mean, from there, mm -hmm. like your journey just kind of, accelerated so much yeah it was it's it was it was a very my first year of school in ministry i felt like i was drinking from a fire hydrant like of growth i feel like god was just unrelenting and dealing with things in my heart unrelenting and changing how i thought about the world and um and in, honestly also encountering me in ways that just were dramatic and subtle and at the same time stewardship of what he's done all at the same time was so accelerated. It felt very, very compact and moving at a very fast pace. It felt like it was, it definitely felt like God was, um, like my school ministry first year definitely felt like I was there at the right, like the Lord was doing something at the right time at the right moment for me. And it was just on cue. It was like, what well, those epic moments where you're like, okay, this is a season that God is doing something in me. 
Did you think when your first years in school of ministry, one of these mm-hmm. days, 12 years from now, I'm going to be <laughs> leading this church? No, not at all. No, I thought I was going to be a youth pastor because I thought that was the chain of command. Like, I was like, you know, you start here, go there. Make... Right. So I was like, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. I just knew that, like, I, I, I saw, I'm like, maybe I'm going to be a youth pastor or something like that. And then eventually become somebody's assistant pastor or, or something like that. And then I, I didn't think about any of that stuff. No, I, I wasn't even thinking about working at the yeah. school either. It would have been, it, it would have right probably there. been like arrogant of you to think that. Oh, st- what? Yes. And I'm like still in maybe, shock that I have any kind of leadership ig- role here. Maybe ignorant, right? But yeah. no, I mean, it's so evident. You know, I remember, I do vaguely remember interviewing you, but I definitely remember interacting with you um, when you were in school ministry and then watching you uh, in second year, especially mm-hmm. um, kind of rise up into leadership. And then Eric uh, taking you under his wing and mm-hmm. you really working yeah. with Eric for a long time in school ministry. Mm-hmm. And then when yeah. Eric became our senior associate pastor, um, yeah. you know, him promoting you. And it's so evident why why God has promoted you. Mm. When I look at your life, like, (laughs) no, I'm not, I'm not actually trying to, it is kind of not trying to be kind. Um, I'm trying to make a point. And, Mm. and for me, like every, everyone, I get this question so many times, like, how do I, like, how do I get, how do I get promoted? Mm. people ask me that a lot. Like, how do I, and and maybe they don't even know how to use that word. Right. They're saying like, how do I find my purpose? How do I become great? How do I, and when I look at you, it's, it's the same thing as when I look at my dad or I look at Bill, Mm. you had the same qualities, Mm. right? You have someone who is relentless is in Mm. relentless pursuit of the call of God in their life, willing to take Mm. any risk, Mm-hmm. and sacrifice as much as need be mm-hmm. to follow that call. Right. Um, mm-hmm. and, and so I watched you serve, I watched you mm-hmm. steward, I watched you, um, persevere through, th- through some mm-hmm. things that, you know, especially yeah. the last five years, right. That most yeah. people wouldn't know. Oh, yeah. I watch you persevere. Mm-hmm. And yeah. again, that's why I love having you on here because mm-hmm. for men, you're a young man. And you're doing mm-hmm. incredible yeah. things, especially for your age. And I love the example of, no, guys, this is what happens when mm-hmm. you become a disciple. Like this is a mm-hmm. perfect picture of real discipleship yeah. and stewardship mm-hmm. of your life. Um, and so well done, Chris. You've, you've just done a phenomenal oh, job. Man. That's awesome. That's kind. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. That's I awesome. want to dive into discipleship. Because okay. I would consider you one of the experts on the topic of discipleship. And Let's for Braveco, <laughs> to us, discipleship is everything, right? Everything that we do mm-hmm. is in context of discipleship. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Following after in, in um, you know, the, the model of Jesus. So when I look at Jesus, yeah. I go, oh, his model was discipleship. And, mm-hmm. but I think that so, it's so cliche for the church the word, but so radical. It's so Mm -hmm. completely radical, like the real model of discipleship for, for men in our society today, because I'm talking to men for men in our society today, like real discipleship is such a radical idea. Uh, and and I'm just Mm -hmm. not sure that, that we really fully understand that most guys really yeah. fully understand what it is. Can you explain what discipleship is a little mm-hmm. bit? And then we're going to dive deeper yeah. into practically. Let's do it. Yeah. I think when most people hear discipleship, they hear the, you know, new believer course at their church or like the, like the, the moment they got serious and they're like, I'm a disciple of Jesus or um, the, the kind of like eight week class on discipleship that they do. Um so Jesus didn't invent the word disciple. Disciple was a word used before him and was a word used in his context, right? So you had Greek philosophers who had disciples. You, John the Baptist, had disciples. It talks about his disciples. And disciples was this idea that you were a, an apprentice, someone who looked at a master 
and said, your take on reality is what I think reality is. And I want to now base my life around what you've defined reality to be. Mm -hmm. And I will build my life around that. And so when Jesus invites these disciples, he's inviting these students and learners of the way of life that he embodied, believing that that life, when transmitted to them, would lead to their entire makeup changing. It was mm -hmm. not like they were going on a, now I'm saved and I can go to heaven. Jesus was going, I am... The early church fathers would say things like this, whatever isn't assumed in Jesus, meaning taken on by him, isn't healed. So Jesus mm. took on humanity so that he would heal it and that they could then enter into a new holistic healing where that the human race could now live to be what God's dream come true for humans were. And God's intention for every human was seen in Jesus. Jesus isn't the one off. He's the firstborn. So he's the he's the initial. He's not the one off. No one ever going to be like him. He's actually trying to be the inauguration, the first coming of all of these new individuals who have learned his way of life and embodied it to such a measure where now they are holistically a tree that bears good fruit. That's what he's looking to do. He's he's not looking to go, how do I get good? How do I get you to have fruit? He's going, how do I get you to be a tree? that is planted well, and then you will bear fruit. You will have holistic transformation from the inside out. You will be different by you basing your life around me. So that's the initial concepts around discipleship. Bro, that's the, that's what he's talking about. That's powerful. Yeah. Like you just, it's very different just, than what people think. Some guys are going to like rewind this. They're going to like, whoa, whoa yeah. hit, <laughs> go back. And because the truth is, I think that that most men, including myself, mm -hmm. growing up, did I didn't have a clue that mm -hmm. that's why mm -hmm. that's why God called us to be disciples, right? That's why Jesus called us to be yeah. disciples. Like I didn't have a clue mm -hmm. that like mm -hmm. he was gonna take on humanity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And not just to go die on a cross. That's a, that's the, that's the doorway in. That's like the, if you're bowling and you see the bowl, if you're playing any kind of, if you're playing in a bowling lane, you'll see that there's, there's targets before the target. And if you, if you line yourself up to those, there's these arrows and bowlers will use those arrows to guide where they want the ball to go 20, like 20 feet later. And so yep. salvation is that like, all right, I've been brought into the kingdom of God. That is that doorway. So you are in through that salvation experience that's, that Jesus has saved you from the destruction of hell, saved you honestly from the hell you're currently experiencing. Like it's not even the like he just saved you with fire insurance. Yes. He's saving you from the current hell you're in. And that's why he would look at the world and be able to say hell is on earth right now. It's This is what's happening in people. And then the reality is that heaven can be on earth right now. So he saves you from the, the, the future destruction of your soul. But he saves you currently from the hell you're experiencing that would lead you to the guarantee of that. He saves you from that too and ushers you through a what would be an entirely human transformation to where it's such a degree of change that Paul would, would call it this, a new creation. He's like that you would be able to say the old has actually passed away and you are new. That kind of extreme language is not for altar calls. It's, it's an yeah. extreme language for you to get the trajectory of God's intention, which is to make you so different and according to your true self that you would, it would be merited to say you're a new creation. That would make sense. Honestly, it's, it's so fascinating. And oh. there's, like, there's like such a deep richness in that truth, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. When you start to go, men, like today, yeah. God's intent for you yeah. is that you would look at yourself in the mirror and go, holy mm -hmm. smokes, I don't even yeah. recognize the mm -hmm. guy that's looking at himself because I have been so completely transformed. Mm -hmm. Like that's, yep. that's God's intent in his discipleship. Yeah. And then 
And then it goes even further than that. Right. Because I feel like people get stuck in these stages. Like they get stuck mm -hmm. in, uh, the center. God's still mm -hmm. trying to save the center. Right. Like a lot yeah. of men are stuck in that, oh, especially yeah. in the, in the Bible belt. Especially when they're stuck like in their sin. Yeah, yeah for sure. absolutely. Yeah. And, and so it's this guy that's, that's never going to be good enough. And, you mm -hmm. know, Jesus just got to die on the cross every day for him. And, and, yeah, yeah. but I, and totally. I also think that, that we get stuck in this idea that like, I got to keep doing good so I don't go to hell, mm -hmm. you know, so that I, yeah. it, it's just this perpetual, like, and so I feel like that's one stage that guys get stuck in, which yeah. is just, that's almost its own hell. It's a, it's a gospel of sin management, which Jesus didn't preach that gospel. Yeah, it's not a, it's that's not a great a, way to Jesus say Jesus didn't preach a gospel of sin management. He didn't preach a gospel that's like, here's how the rest of your life you're going to manage your sin. He, he didn't, that's not what he came and said. He, that, that's, he's going he's gonna to actually save you from your sins. He says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's actually looking to deal with it decisively. Like, he he's... His, it, every intention was to deal a decisive blow to the sin in your life. Not a Somebody not just... a way for you to be equipped to handle it for the rest of your life. He, though that is true, sometimes people struggle and they're navigating it. And we we do that. But what we don't want to do is create a theology around Jesus, around those that were are still navigating their struggle. I get the struggle. I get that. That's it. I'm not trying to uh, demean anyone. And and. If, if I do demean anyone, it's only because I'm trying to preach the gospel that Jesus preached, which is a decisive blow to the sin in your life. I mean, so to me, like I, somebody just pulled their car over and went, holy smokes, I can yeah. be free of this, which is part of like, that's the, yeah. that to me is like a baseline. It's, it's like the baseline for the disciple is like, hey, listen, totally. right here, we're going to, we're going to yeah. get this out. We're going to get this clean. We're, yeah. And then... Mm -hmm. Right. We're going to bring some heaven to earth. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the tool that I'm using is you, mm -hmm. pal. Like yeah, you have a divine exactly. purpose, a divine, mm -hmm. a divine uh, purpose. You are divinely created to do good works, mm -hmm. right? To, yeah. to help usher in the presence of God, to help be mm -hmm. a catalyst in, in yep. the kingdom. And, and so one of the things that I wrote down, like, I feel like a lot of people, come out of the church and they don't actually even understand why I'm be, being discipled. Like why would, mm. because it feels so boring. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now I know I, I just that. made a big mm -hmm. statement, but uh, let no, me no. just paint a picture. Like when I grew mm -hmm. up in the church. Yeah. I mean, I had to read my Bible every day, you know, <laughs> the Proverbs yeah. or whatever. I, I mean, typically I'd pick a Proverbs or a Psalm. Yeah. Because you could you could read a quick chapter. Yeah, I was gonna know? say so you could get through a chapter like that. You could get through a chapter quick, bro. And of course, like that's both good and bad, right? So right. Mm -hmm. growing up yeah. having to having to read the Bible before I go over a friend's house or before I go shoot my pellet gun outside was like mm -hmm. I just learned how to read without mm -hmm. even thinking. And so yeah. it, it became this like yeah. You know, and you go to church. My dad used to, I'd say all the time, like, dad, do I have to go to church? He'd say, no, you don't have to, you get to, which get to, again, yeah. I yeah. love, I love yes. the discipline side of that. Yeah. There was, yeah. there wasn't, it wasn't even worth the argument with my dad. There was no point in even going down that road. <laughs> I can't even imagine that happen. argument with your dad. <laughs> Bro, it would be like arguing with your dad. Yeah. yeah. Not going to no, happen. Never going to happen. Never yeah. going to happen. And mm. so... <clears throat> But what, what did happen to me is following God became really boring. It became mm. this, this yeah. mundane rhythm that mm -hmm. I had to do in order to do the things that I really wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until I wasn't until I really had an encounter with God mm -hmm. and I fell in love with the person mm -hmm. that actual, yeah. you know, not the theory, but I fell in love with the person yeah. and that coupled with me realizing my purpose yeah. in, 
in mm-hmm. Christ, right? Like my yeah. uh, my God given purpose. Like God wants to build me into a transformer of people. Once yeah. I capture that, right? yeah. Because when you think about that, like when I think about Jesus's invitation to the fishers, to the fishermen, isn't hey come and um, find your best friends? He's like come and I'm going to make you fishers of men. He offers them purpose. He offers them a sense of like, hey, you're going to, I'm going to make you into something that does this. And so when we look at discipleship, we have to understand that there is um, dimensions of the disciples journey, right? And processes of formation. So you are Mm. formed by your relationship to the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit shapes you, forms you. You're formed by your relationship to scripture. Scripture shapes you and forms you. You're formed by your relationship to how you see Jesus. Like how you see him is going to shape and form you. Um, how you see the Father is going to shape and form you. And then you got to think about how you relate to other people. It's going to shape and form you. Then God has every intention of making you like Christ. His, his objective is to make you like Christ. And Christ mm-hmm. understood this about himself. For the Father has sent me. He was on a mission. And so he says, so the father sends you a disciple that remains only inwardly focused is a a disciple that has failed to actually get a full glance of the master. Because if you understood him, you would recognize I get whole and there's some part of me that's meant to heal the world. There's some part of me that's meant to actually contribute to the to the well-being of this planet. There's something about me that's made in a way that I'm actually supposed to move this thing 1% better, 2% better, 3% better, 25, whatever it is that your impact is, that your sphere of influence, whatever size that could be, could be your family and a couple of friends. It could be you start a major men's ministry or you lead a church or you have a business. But either way, you have to look at this, that God has decided that in your journey of learning him, being because a disciple has to be with Jesus. They have to learn how to be shaped by getting alone with him. And then they have to learn how to have him move through them. And so that the ministry of Jesus continues, because that's why he gives the spirit of God that the revolution that Jesus started would continue. That this movement that would so when the, he would say, when the kingdom of God comes upon you, it is by the spirit. And he would say that if the if your demon casts out of you, it is by the spirit that the kingdom of God has come upon you. So, but what he's getting at is this disciples who operate in a kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom is what Jesus would say. Now the gospel of sin management, the gospel of the kingdom, he would, he would do this. They would, the blind would see, the deaf would hear, the lame would walk, the dead would rise, the oppressed get free the poor find uh prosperity the the uh religiously dead get spiritually awakened the uh anxious find rest you now become catalytic to whatever reality god wants on the earth to happen and so you become you become you become a cultural catalyst everywhere you go yes absolutely 100%. One hundred percent. That God is looking for you to be an access point as a disciple. That He's Man, looking for the, His world to flow through you. It's like it's like the most exciting thing in the world. Which is what I want men to grasp a hold of is yeah. inside of be, being a disciple. Like the more you mm-hmm. get to know God, the more you understand your mission. The the yeah. more you 100%. the closer you get in relationship with God, the more equipped you become. For, for the purpose yes. that God built you, like your purpose lies mm-hmm. inside of your walk with Christ. Yeah. This, this, yeah. and it's, it's which, whole unto giving away. It's whole unto giving away. Like I think about my journey with my own son and yeah. me and him had a crazy moment this morning. You know, dads on the podcast will know these moments where you're like, I didn't handle that well. Me and him had a yeah. frustrating moment. He wasn't listening at all. And it becomes a, a really explosive moment. Screaming's happening from him and, and from me. And we're, 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 we're in this heated moment, right? And my, my wife has to tell me like, hey, what is going on? You need to go, 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 go step away for a second and come back. 
So then I work out my stuff for, for like five minutes. I come back to my wife. I'm like, okay, this is what was going on. All right. And then I go, I'm going to go sit with him. So I open up his door and he's a, he's just, he could have, if he had a shoe in his hand, he would have thrown it. <laughs> so I open the door and I go, Hey bud, can we talk about our mess together? At that mm -hmm. moment, I'm being a catalyst to my son's well-being and my well-being. Yes. Like it's, and but I have to have the courage. I have to have the boldness, and and the 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 never give up mentality. The what I would tell people the the willingness to like the will to win, that says I'm going to yeah. go back to my son. I'm going to work this out intimately with him. We're going to talk to each other about this. I'm going to share where I was wrong and ask him for forgiveness. And I'm going to share with him where he was wrong and where he needed to work through stuff. And then we're going to come together on how we could do it better. That was my, my, my morning. My son's five. And I'm going, this is, this is what this is. And him and I are talking through how we could do things differently together. But I'm being a catalyst saying, because I didn't have a, because I had a, a tough moment, I don't then go and say, screw this. I'm done. No, because people who are disciples of Jesus see a man who went on a cross and goes, if Christ goes to a cross and dies on a cross and resurrects, my little moment here, I there's something on the other side of this if I can endure this and bring there's something the to the standard. Somebody. Yeah. It's like, if he did that, I can do this. So I went back to my son. I own that. I endure that the pain of that moment. And I get through and I become catalytic for my son and my family. So husbands who choose to give up or spouses who choose to give up in that space right there, I, it, it for me, I'm going, this is part of your discipleship journey and your purpose. It's not just, do I have a great business? But if you don't see the courage and necessary to show up as a good husband, show up as a good dad and go back into these moments, like that's everything in the disciples journey. Man, um, the unfortunate thing is you and I don't have a ton of time today. <laughs> just a short, a short window. Let's keep and going so, for a few uh, more minutes. I like it. Okay, cool. <laughs> you know, when we're talking about becoming a disciple, right? Um, yeah. You can't skip the process to how to mm -hmm. really understand and learn God more. And I want to talk about that a little bit because mm -hmm. you wrote a, a book, um, which yeah, I think is phenomenal. Of being with Jesus. Yeah, I recommend it all the time, The Practice of Being with Jesus. And here's why I'm so passionate about your book is um, because- You talk about my work, book more than I do, which is so kind. <laughs> <laughs> because I spent so much time learning how to fulfill my duty in reading the Bible, yeah. uh, the it became so, so boring to me, right? And, mm -hmm. and um, you know- I would go years without reading my Bible, mm -hmm. except to prepare for preaching, you know, totally. that kind of stuff, like totally. the stuff that I, I had to yeah. do in make withdrawals. Yeah. And here's the other reason I was never taught. Yeah. Like I was never fair. actually taught how to read the mm -hmm. word and why to read the word and how to study. Like I'm still learning how to study the Bible. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's a big too. question that I still have. Like, Okay. Yeah. How do I read the word? How do I study? Right, right, but, right. But when we're, you know, I want to just dive into it a little bit because I feel like in closing, mm -hmm. it's important for guys to understand how to interact with scripture in a way mm -hmm. that brings them into deeper revelation to who Christ is and then mm -hmm. brings them into deeper revelation of who they are. And can you just mm -hmm. give us just a little bit, uh, some tools for that? Um, yeah, because I think it'll sure. really help some guys. Yeah, uh, I think a basic basic way for people to approach this is with three different ways of looking at the Bible for yourself. Which is, but there's an overarching uh, thing you need to know is that God, the Bible exists because God is determined within Himself to be a revealing God, hmm. that He actually wants to make Himself known to you. The reason you have scripture is because God is saying, I want to reveal myself to you. I want to be known by you. So there's so not a hiddenness by God. The reason you even have a Bible is because he's deeply desiring for you to explore him and know him. And yeah. so you have this overarching thing there. The, the three things that I would say to do, first one is recognize there's, 
there's a study of scripture, which the question you're asking in the study of scripture is this, what is the, what does this thing actually mean? What does this verse actually mean? It's the original intent of the author. What did Paul actually mean in this verse? What did, great. is actually going on in the story accurately? You're kind of just looking at it from more of a study perspective. You're uh, kind of examining it. Then the second one is devotional. And the question you're asking there is, what does this mean to me? You now know what Paul was trying to say. You can get a grid, you can buy a study Bible, you can get all kinds of things like that that can get you an understanding of what Paul originally meant. And then you're going, you're crossing over what we would call a principalizing bridge. And you're going, what does this actually mean to me now? Okay, there's no slave, nor free, nor um, Jew or Gentile in Christ that, well, okay, Paul, what, is Paul, what was Paul dealing with in Galatians? Oh, he's dealing with um, people having superiority based off of this. Well, what is God saying to you in that now? Now you know and you can find out what is he saying to me through this verse. And then meditative. And that is how do I get this verse in me? So you have these three layers of what is the original language? What is, sorry, what is the original meaning of this text? What is it? I'm studying it more just study. Second, what does it mean to me? And third, how do I get it in me? And third, you may be camping out on a verse for a month, two months, three months, just reading it over and over again and letting yourself meditate on it. It's devotional. You may be reading a couple verses and kind of just pulling out how it applies to your life and what you're going through currently. In study, you may be just getting a better grasp on the over our overarching story of the Bible and getting a better grid for um, some theological perspectives. And you're you're and you won't be doing all of these at the same time. Th there's moments where you're deeper into a study where you're like, okay, I've got to dive in a little bit deeper here and get a, more examination. Or you may be like, I, I I'm in this devotional state where I'm really trying to get the Bible to to teach what I'm currently going through. Give me wisdom for what I'm going through. In life and then meditative you might be in a season where you're just like i'm just reading the psalms over and over again right now and I, i'm wanting to get it in me so i would start there as a base like way to start when when you're reading scripture mm -hmm. with the hopes of getting a revelation mm -hmm. on yeah Christ. i'm always anticipating god to speak to me always I don't, I, it's rare that I read the Bible without an anticipation that I'm going to hear God say something mm. or get something from it. Mm. So are you prepared to write down? Are, like, yeah, I have a journal with me at times. Yeah, journal or notes in my phone. Yeah. Do you read to finish a chapter or do you read to, no. like, what's your, when you sit down, what's your process? Well, it's like today, this morning, my process was, um, reading a part of the Psalms where it says, you will complete, uh, you will perfect everything concerning me. And I thought about every situation. I went into way more meditative. I went into every situation that I need God's hand to complete. Mm. And I was like, you are going to complete everything concerning me. And so I stayed wow. there because the, the biggest thing in my, in my time with the Bible is not just to, to get the Bible in me. I mean, sorry, not just get to the Bible, but to commune with God. Yeah. And so I'm going that moment, the scriptures were a gateway into God's presence to change the way I saw the world to go this scenario, this scenario, and this scenario that are pressing on my heart. You have said to me, you have promised in scripture, you will perfect the things that are concerning me. And it's so powerful. The, like, so that's what I did this morning. I love this. And I, I mean, I think we'll just have to do a part two to this. Yeah, um, sounds good. Because it's just so deep, right? And I think mm -hmm. when each one of these keys unlocks a yeah. true, like it's a true. deeper it's passion, related. like when I hear you talk about that, I'm like, oh man, I want to, like, it makes me want to go back and dive in <laughs> to the Bible. And recently what I did is I, I'm doing a bunch of studying on leadership and, and oh, nice. I'm getting ready to do a bunch of teaching on leadership. And so I'm like, oh, how does God see leadership in the Bible? You know question, what I mean? Like, man. There's a lot in there. Yeah, there's a ton in there. And so I did a John Maxwell Bible study, right? So he did a, nice. he has John Maxwell, leadership through John Maxwell. Mm -hmm. and, and so sometimes that's how, how I dive into like, okay, I want to see on a specific topic or... um. But for me, it's really new to me, the meditative or contemplative yeah. 
Mm -hmm. you know, processing through of the words of Jesus. And then how does that really work to me right now? Like maybe reading Psalms 23 Mm -hmm. and going through it, like, God, you're shepherding me today. Like you're actually, and then looking through the different places, like, okay, what place Mm -hmm. in my life are you restoring? And what does that look like in how are you forcing me to lie down? (laughs) Like, like you wait, so I've done Psalms 23 as a meditative verse for about six months okay. and I've used it as my anchor. And so I've, I've started and said, the Lord is my shepherd and I am not. Oh, and I've camped yeah. out at that phrase for Bro. 20 minutes to 30 minutes to an hour. And have said that the Lord is my shepherd and I am not just okay, that can phrase I, alone. Can I, Go ahead. here's what I want to link for men. Here's what, because this is what I want to link. What's happening for us when you dive in to the heart of God for you and to Mm -hmm. his instruction Mm -hmm. for you, Mm -hmm. you are being honed, shaped, uh, strengthened. One, like one side of it is this honing, this strengthening, this shaping, this correction to be in right relationship so that you can go be freaking powerful, right? Yeah, so that fruitful. his will can be perfected through you. And so like, when, as you were talking about Psalms 23, I'm just like, oh, it's mm-hmm. like what the, what the samurai goes through. He just goes through yeah, like this, totally. this just perfecting, mm-hmm. perfecting, perfecting so yeah. that he can go accomplish his purpose and will. And again, like men, when we are reading the word, when we're, when we are mm-hmm. uh, allowing God to see us like one, yeah, it's it's nice to to check the list. It's cool. Mm-hmm. I like to go. Oh, I read the yeah. Bible every day yeah. this week. That's yeah. fine. Feel good and the sad better now. <laughs> thing, yeah, the better thing is. Oh, I felt God's presence today. Mm-hmm. That's well, incredible. Jim, let, like, me, let me end with this stop for you and what you're drawing the line. You're drawing this line yep. behind repetitive action and the training of your your mind, your soul versus trying harder and training, and how yep. training is different than trying harder, and think about this. I'll end with this story from Jesus that gets people a picture. Jesus fasts in the wilderness for 40 days. We think fasting and we just go, oh gosh, man, this dude was not eating food for 40 days. Holy cow. But think about this. For 40 days, he was training himself to say no. What comes at the end of those 40 days? He better have the strongest no of his life. Yep. He is tempted in three distinct questions about his purpose, his identity, what he's meant to do. But he, people think Jesus was um, at a disadvantage in the wilderness. Well, Jesus is led to the wilderness by the Spirit. And Jesus knows something that so many of us forget, which is anywhere with the Spirit is an advantage. I'm, yes, it's, it's his home so turf. Good. So he's like, this is my home turf. I am now going to tr- be preparing myself for what's going to come my way. Mm. I need to say no. And he trained himself to say no for 40 days in a way that was like, that is a crucial no Jesus had to give. So I think sometimes yeah. we overlook that training part of the discipleship journey to go, I don't know why I'm doing this. And then all of a sudden, one day, you got to go into battle and you realize it works. Mr. Miyagi, wax on, wax off, man. You're waxing the car and then you realize why you're doing those motions to block kicks and punches, man. It's so true. You know, I just love it because God looks at every man that's that's on this planet that's listening to this and he goes, you are my idea to Mm -hmm. destroy darkness. You are my idea to bring light. You're my idea to build confidence in other people to like, you were my idea and, and I want to grow you, you know, come follow me, like leave, Mm -hmm. leave the mundane, boring, purposeless life and come join me on a life of, of adventure, a life of equipping, a life of perfecting, a life of growth, yeah. a life of, of struggle, but, but do great also a life of purpose and do something great. Mm-hmm. Chris, man, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, dude. Again, so you're fun. such a blessing. Guys, yeah, if you want to get um if you want to get more involved in what Chris is doing, again, he has that book, The Practice yeah. of Being with Jesus. I highly recommend it. Uh go through that book. It's a it's a 28 day devotional. Um, it's mm-hmm. phenomenal. And uh, you can follow Chris on Instagram. But Chris, thank you so much for coming on. Love you, man. Appreciate you. Of course. An honor. 
Hey guys, thanks so much for listening to the Brave Co. Podcast. If you like this podcast, would you please rate it, review it, leave us a great comment. And if you like this episode in particular, share it with your friends and family. That helps us to spread the word. Guys, stay brave. We'll see you next week.